five speeches, and I'd like to call back an opposition speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's debate, side proposition has brought you a case that just isn't based in the real world. A real world where the way people think and perceive things matters. A real world where majoritarianism doesn't justify everything. But most importantly, a real world where mass murder isn't a neo-colonialist value. To show you why opposition has won this debate, I'm going to answer three questions. Firstly, who is best for political stability? Secondly, who is best for justice? And third, who is best for international relations? So let's firstly look at political stability. We've got to ask, is a trial that bad? And we just say no. But here are the facts of the matter. Firstly, he can continue as president, that you don't have to make appearances in your country, and that policy can be created from remote locations. Secondly, that his removal just isn't that damaging, that he's a bad figurehead right now because there's a perception he's dodging justice, that rejecting a trial has made him weak with international relations and unable to negotiate with the Western world with people that really matter. Now to this, they say, but you're going to undermine the entire party and what about the choice of the people? We just said we don't value the choice of the people if they're choosing to vote in war criminals. We don't think pure majoritarianism stands. We limit their ability to choose someone if they're genuinely guilty of a crime, which not only has coerced the election, but has undermined their basic mandate as a president of a country. That is analysis I gave you in my first speech. That it doesn't matter if they chose him if he's undermined his mandate to his people. But that secondly, if he's innocent, this is actually better. Because what we think is that if you compare being out of the country for a few months, compared to the value that you gain when you're absolved of guilt, and have proper buy-in not only from moral society, but also from the people you persecuted, that is a much better comparative. But the second question to ask is, why is no trial bad for stability? But yeah, they give you a really simplistic line that all has been forgiven and that all is well in Kenya. But what they don't understand is that the harm is in the realization and message sent via their action. That the withdrawal has done two things. One, it's that even if he only paid for the militia, that isn't something which is wrong. So if it was innocent, then he should go to trial and people would see that. But the fact that he's saying he doesn't want to go to trial means that paying, which is the widely known perception, is something which is okay. We don't think that's true. But secondly, it's saying that we prioritize, like their case, the value of a president to a country over justice for the people. Because that's essentially the case they brought you and we think that most Kenyans would see that too. Why is this bad? Well, we tell you in unrebutted analysis that in terms of society, we get the victims becoming separate and or antagonistic, and that the persecutors gain impunity. Now, none of that was responded to. All they said was everything's forgiven and there's no harm. Secondly, we undermine democracy because now people are scared, because now people are seeing that he's saying it's okay to kill people, that he's saying I would rather be in power than admit that I killed some people. That is the harm that they have to deal with. The second question is about justice, and here they made two very distinct claims about why Kenya is okay. The first thing they said is that the ICC is wrong, right? Firstly, in terms of morality, we say that's not true. They never managed to rebut that morality in this case is objective. But that secondly, it's not neo-colonialist to believe that you should be prosecuted for mass murder. The only thing they could give was kind of a counter-consideration of why is an American prosecuted? And we told you that isn't because of neo-colonialism, it's because one country didn't sign the ICC charter. The second claim they give you is that Kenya is seeking justice other ways. So they conceive themselves that Kenya needs justice. And we tell you four reasons why that's not going to happen. One, because there's denial by the regime, which means there isn't actually that seeking. Two, that there's presidential immunity. Three, that there's no political will to put him through a, pr a process of justice. And four, that the justice itself in the country or any local mechanism isn't good because courts are biased because we can't get witnesses when we don't have international power. If they wanted to say we had to prove why the ICC was good, they should have showed you why the ICC was bad. We think we can just assume that it works because they haven't given us any matter. The last thing then is international relations. And here they say that we unite Africa. We say fine, there are other ways to do that. But you haven't rebutted our analysis that no matter why you reject the ICC, whether it's neocolonialism or anything else, you fundamentally alienate the West, specifically if you're saying it's because of neocolonialism. And why? Losing aid and losing international ties is way, way worse than just gaining unity in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, they needed to engage with the reality that stability does not come from forgetting. That justice does not come from calling mass murder neo-communism. I am proud to applaud.